Hey there, welcome to our 10th live AMA session. This time we're talking about technical due diligence in B2B SaaS acquisitions. And our awesome guests today are Chris Phillips, founder of Phillips & Byrne, a consulting company that offers in-depth tech due diligence and health checks. And Tobias uh, Schlotte, co-founder and CTO of SaaS Group, um, founder of CTO community called Alpha List, and the list goes on and on. So I'll just stop here. Uh, welcome, great to see you here. And um, yeah, maybe we can get into a bit more in-depth introductions. So Chris, should we start with you? Yes, of course. Uh, so maybe I start with my personal background. Um, I spent more than 20 years now um, in the tech industry and particularly in the startup industry. I worked as a CTO and interim CTO for around 10 years. And uh, nowadays we work together a lot with investors on the one hand, but also founders uh, on the other hand. And we always say I help them build the, the world of tomorrow, but that's in a nutshell exactly what we do, like assisting them building startups for the future. Awesome. Wow. Well, now the, now the bar is raised to like a very yes. level introduction wise. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Toby. I'm co-founder of SaaS Group. Uh, what we do is we, we acquire, like we are on the buy side, actually, we acquire small bootstrap SaaS companies and um, then help them like kind of develop from, like we're not so good in, in zero to one, but we help them to, to scale from one to 10. Uh, that's our idea. Um, and yeah, we have almost 20 brands now. Uh, so we call the companies brands um, uh, that we acquire. Um, and um, that leads to like a, a big team of now 300 people. Like I, I really love working with those folks on their tech stacks and their products and a really deep dive in many, many different areas. Um, and yeah, besides that, I also sold my company. So I also sat on the other side and I, I partly like even um, more as a as freelance gig also also did some tech due diligences and really like what Chris is doing. So it's really nice to um, talk to to, to, to the founders and talk to the CTO and, and really deep dive in, in many different business models. So I'm a bit jealous here, but uh, I, I can do the same now. So <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. All right, awesome to have you here. And uh, just a quick reminder, we are live. So, you know, drop in with your questions. Uh, I have quite a few and maybe we can start with the most obvious one and the easiest one. What is tech due diligence? Uh, what is the focus of tech due diligence for B2B SaaS acquisitions. Chris? Um, I always have three answers on the question, what is a tech DD? And uh, the first one is a formal answer. It's like, okay, a tech DD is an assessment of leadership, team, product, and technology. The second one is a more generic, which is like, it's in the end, the answer on the question, uh, does a company have everything it needs to be successful uh, with regards to technology and product and team? Uh, and my most favorite answer, of course, it's TechDD should be the most thorough and the most honest feedback a company and founders can ever get. Uh, so, and yeah, that's what we are trying to do. Yeah, I think it's a very honest conversation. Um, and it, it should be a very open and honest conversation about uh, like what is what is working, what is not. Okay. Exactly. We always say it's a it's a conversation starter, or it should at least be at least a conversation starter. Sometimes even for the most difficult topics uh, that get on the table between investors uh, and founders, and I think that's a that's a good thing to have that conversation as early as possible. All right. So apart from the actual tech stack uh, strategy architecture, what else uh, is included and is being assessed? So, I mean, the the tech stack is, of course, obvious. I mean, um, you look at uh, architecture, you look at uh, basically the CICD environment, you look at code base, at least in, uh, to some extent. Uh, but apart from that, um, of course, uh, the overall context is even more important. Um, so we always uh, start with wanting to understand what the investor or a uh, buyer really wants with the company. What is the plan here? What is the strategy? And on the other hand, we also talk with the founders about their business model, 
their strategy, their growth plans, etc., in order to create that overall context uh, in which uh, tech is navigating, basically. And apart from that, there are, of course, like topics such as uh, product management as a function, but also um, product management in terms of roadmap. Um, then, of course, the organization, the engineering organization, product organization, data in many regards. And then there are a couple of additional topics depending on the exact uh, context uh, that you deal with. And the company size, right? <laughs> and the company uh, size. Like having it? experience with like many small tech due diligences or due diligences uh, in general, it, it really depends a lot on the, on the company size um, and uh, the business obviously as like a team with five people is treated way differently to, to a company with i don't know what your biggest uh, uh company was that where, where did you did a tech tg chris um, 1500 uh, yeah. in engineering Good. yeah quite 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 different i would say right um yeah but but generally yeah uh, i i fully agree okay all right so uh I got a fun question. What is the biggest misconception about technical due diligence? I know Toby wanted to answer this, so you can go first. I like the question. Um, and uh, yes, it's not purely about code, right? Like most people think, hey, uh, this is like Chris sitting in his quiet office uh, looking at the code uh, and the code base and, and finding out everything that can be found out through the code base. and through uh, the AWS account and, and uh, most likely, Chris, that, that is not true, I, I assume. So happy to hear like what, what you're really doing. But uh, yeah, I, th I think like it's, it's not about code. Um, it's more about people in most cases. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's about people. And um, as I said before, it's mainly about context. I mean, that is also, I think, one of the challenges uh, we always uh, deal with as CTOs, engineers, founders that tech is so highly context dependent, right? So as you said, Toby, what might be right in a bigger company is might be totally wrong in a smaller one. Or if you um, are in a SaaS context, it might be something totally different from what is required in a, in a let's say, uh, consumer product company or in something, something else. So, um, always looking at, okay, what does the business actually need? And that can be features and functionality on the one hand, that can be people um, and spirit on the other hand, and that can be very kind of profane things such as sometimes it's even compliance. For example, if you look at a healthcare company, at a med tech company or financial company, for example, does that answer your question, Anna? Sorry. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Just one addition from my side. Um, yeah. One funny thing, like as we're, we're mostly looking at SaaS companies and, and small bootstrap SaaS companies uh, or small to medium uh, bootstrap SaaS companies, mm -hmm. one thing I observe myself always looking at is still the code. Like it's what you start with, um, like looking at GitHub, uh, looking at insights, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then digging deeper on the insights because uh, it's like a, interesting patterns that you see there. Uh, that in many cases, the, the founder, even if it's now the CEO, was the most active contributor uh, for years. And sometimes that changes. And then it's like interesting who took over and, and who's really like developing that, uh, sailing that ship. Um, so that, that's for me always like a, a good conversation starter. Yeah, it's interesting because for, for us, the conversation starter mostly in terms of tech uh, is the architecture discussion. Uh, uh, this is when, I mean, uh, when we do the architecture discussion, usually we had already a conversation about the business model, et cetera, et cetera, H had a little demo, had a little bit uh, look uh, into product management, but like uh, the architecture session is usually the grand opening um, conversation uh, in tech and in engineering. And I like that so much because there you can see whether engineers and engineering leaders have actually understood uh, the business context. Yeah? So, and for me, it's also super interesting which language they speak uh, in terms of architecture. Is it something have they, you can also immediately see, for example, um, have the people who are in the meeting um, 
ever drawn an architectural diagram, for example? What are they used to think in, for example, models of domain dri driven design or, or like, or haven't they ever talked about it or ever thought about it and just draw a box and this is our application. Yeah? So stuff like that is super interesting. And then later on, of course, we also look into code. Yeah. That, that shows a lot about maturity of a, of a software company, right? Um, and yeah. um, it's also like really the first question that um, I would always ask in a tech TD, um, apart from like, hey, give me access to your code, um, is, um, hey, where's your architecture di diagram? And, and many companies actually created for that purpose, right? That's also like, I think what, what reality is. Um, but yeah, you can, you can see, uh, like it tells a lot about the maturity um, of the team how well they can do it and how deep they actually go. Or if they ask, uh, hey, what do you mean? Architecture diagram. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> I was about to say that. I would say in every, maybe nowadays in every 20th DD, we get asked that question. I would say five to 10 years ago, it was like every fifth to 10th DD that uh, people said like, what do you mean with architecture diagram? Uh, so what is that? Uh, so that nowadays has changed, uh, which is a good thing, but still that we, we can immediately tell whether teams have that culture of, for example, having architectural groups like engineers participating in architectural discussions, having kind of uh, communities of practice around it, keep track of architectural decisions with a like architectural decision record or something like that sounds very bureaucratic, but it isn't. It can be very, very lightweight. It can be like five lines in a wiki in most of the cases, but it's so important, especially, and you may know this, Tobias, if you deal with, not with like seed startups or something like that, but companies who have already grown considerably and have aged, have become five, 10, 20 years old, then you, as an engineer who joins the company, you must know, okay, which decisions have been made in the past and why. Because if you lose all that knowledge, you might step into the same trap again, right? And say like, okay, here, I, I, I want to exchange that framework or switch the programming language or introduce uh, Elastic uh, Search or whatever, because I believe this is the right solution. But maybe the team has already done that and has had very particular experiences and learnings with it. And it would be good for an engineer to at least to at least know about the most important decisions. And therefore, for me, that's, that's a key essential that um, teams are used to having this culture of discussing, discussing architecture, documenting it, and keeping track of it to a certain extent, at least. Thank you. That was a great answer. Uh, all right. I think we have like the first question from live audience. Uh, how do you see the importance of security evolving in tech due diligence today, meaning understanding the security posture on the seller side? Chris? It's a good one. I love that. Security per se is important, of course, because um, I mean, I don't know who of you has already had a security incident. I used to have one like 20 years ago um, when I still had a different business and it was not funny, absolutely not. It was probably uh, the most awful days in my professional life. And that is something that can be become very expensive from a, a data breach GDPR point of view, for example but it can also cause a lot of brand damage. This is why security should be always considered, even if it's a less important topic. But of course, there are, let's say, different degrees of importance. If you have a platform for sharing cat pictures or something like that, uh, probably it's not that important as if you had a SaaS company um, that deals with financial data, for example, of your clients. I also like in a, in a DD, let's say it's not a fully fledged, huge DD of a, of a huge company, but like small to mid-size uh, SaaS companies, 
Um, we always check the basics, but we focus clearly on product security here. Yeah? I mean, there's like information security and product security, and we always check, for example, okay, are there any issues with, um, uh, let's say, unfiltered uh, user input? Yeah, classic. Like when you you have uh, your there's an SQL injection vulnerability in your code base. That's a classic, for example. Or how do you manage? access rights to your infrastructure uh, and do you have a bastion host in place host in place or can everybody from the team just uh, freely access your live uh, production environment stuff like that so there there's always a bit of probing uh, in order to get a sense whether there are certain security rules and also a security mindset and best practices are in place and i think that should be something that is absolutely essential for for any company no matter whether it's SaaS or not and whether what exactly the industry focus here is and i would be interested in your opinion as well tobias i personally think if i deal with anything that contains sensitive client data or user data then i'm always up for having a at least like devsecops role for example on a team someone who has at least a a focus on the security topic and carries that role. Whereas in bigger teams, of course, that is for me a dedicated role. But usually when we talk about like uh, small to medium sized companies, let's be honest, in most of the cases, that is, uh, that is not reality. To me, um, what do you I, think? I, I, I agree. <laughs> Even in bigger companies, that's often not reality. Uh, I mean, mm. I think also CISOs, uh, especially if they're really good, are not easy to full-time employ, right? It's not a thing you like to do uh, typically to be employed in one company and be responsible for, for security. That's at least how I see it. But obviously the, like security maturity starts way earlier than having uh, necessarily like uh, full responsibility or a CISO in, in place who's really doing it full-time with very easy things, right? Like having the basics Credentials and code is, I think, the best uh, yeah. example of, of, of that many, many companies still do wrong and uh, don't have like a, an answer for, or at least a, like an automatic check that just like solves it. Or yeah, as you said, SQL injections, et cetera, that's relatively easy to check. You don't need someone full time. You, you could also start with uh, just having a few basics uh, like secure like a security txt which is public which people can crawl and can can figure out your idea on security and reach out yeah easy things to implement right or for example like just a vulnerability scanner um, of all your your libraries you, you use yeah that's a no brainer it doesn't cost anything to use that but uh, it it keeps your house clean, at least uh, the basics. And I would say nowadays, the majority of the teams have that, but still we keep seeing teams who haven't even heard about it. And that is definitely something. So vulnerability scanner, also like having static code analysis tools in place. There are plugins for SonarCube and, and uh, several tools to also have basic security screens having just a handful of rules in place for your, uh, for your engineering team, maybe having a lightweight security training once a year or something, performing a pen test uh, outside in by a, by a third party once a year, even that gives you already um, a certain foundation in terms of security without having like, uh, fancy roles in place or without having hire, having to hire extra people. And that is for me, that is, as I said, the foundation that, that everybody should adhere to. But question is like, what do you do if it's not there? Like how many tech TDs do you actually see failing, uh, because of this missing? If I'm honest, I don't see so many DDs or so many acquisitions failing because of, of those issues of such issues, the awareness should be there from my perspective and the willingness to change in many cases. And that's yeah. like also easy to change, right? Um, People keep asking me how many percent of uh, DDs fail or something like that. And that's always a tricky question because of course it's an equation uh, yeah, with many numbers and or, or with many factors. And one is, one is the DD basically, uh, the tech DD basically. And so 
Of course, there are rarely any cases where a deal falls through because of security. I remember two. Um, one had just such a vulnerable setup that it became a risk per se. Uh, and the other one was, let's say, in a medical context. So there... Uh, vulnerabilities were seen critic more critically than, for example, in SaaS. But as you said, it's the awareness. If tech leaders, it, it's a different thing for me, whether they have a couple of small security issues and they say, we are aware of it. This is our roadmap. We are going to fix them. We did a prioritization. These are the basics we have in place. So then it's a no-brainer. Then it ends up on our recommendation list that comes with a report. And usually investors or buyers say like, yeah, please fix it. Yeah, If it's a big, bigger package, I don't know how you do it, but usually it's being considered like, okay, if it's a couple of hundred K, for example, it needs to be considered in the valuation. But that's basically it. If the awareness is not there, that you even have to take care of that topic and address it, that's maybe a different story. And at least if it's one uh, besides many, many topics that are lacking. Yeah. It all boils down to the conversation you have, right? Is it a good conversation yeah. or not, right? Are you exactly. willing to learn or not? In many cases for us, it, it, it's as well like, is the founder staying and how long? And if he's staying for longer, then it's obviously something that he should also accept in like changing, right? If, if not, then But it's a different conversation. Maybe, Toby, I would be interested, particularly in, in your perspective here as a, as a buyer. So how do you see it exactly? I have actually one story where we had a security issue, where, which was coming from credentials and code combined with open database ports, like wide open database ports and a standard password that was like everywhere uh, where the founder had a standard password, we still acquired the company and we fixed it all like in a, and funny enough, there was a code leak because of the DD, funny enough. And that led to us really like playing cat and mouse and having to hurry up. We, we still acquired the brand or the company. And uh, it was actually a good decision. Um, so I, I think in, in, in most cases, if it's something you can change, then it is okay. And if there's willingness to change or if you can change it, that's okay. I think it's also a big difference whether, for example, you sell your company uh, to a company like yours or whether you sell your company to a corporate, for example. Uh, so we also work with corporate clients on the buyer side and their security uh, is an entirely different topic. Uh, I, I think, to be honest, we are both founders coming from the startup scene. So we're kind of pragmatic with that regard and uh, it can be fixed. In a corporate context, even smaller startups are being assessed much more rigidly uh, on security and compliance topics. And let's say they're... Uh, very often less pragmatic people that have to make that decision, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. And it's like, if I would acquire a bank, I would obviously treat it like yeah. a hot potato, but I'm not. So uh, for, for me, it's, yeah. from my perspective, it's okay in most cases. And nothing to worry about. The, the more important piece from my perspective is also the product, which often is Yeah, something that, that people easily lose track of because they are looking at financials and they are looking at tech, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like the product market fit and how well a product is standing in the market, how the customer cohorts are developing, et cetera, et cetera. That's in most cases, the most like business beats tech in most cases, right? Yeah, we agree. Okay, that was quite a comprehensive answer. Uh, since we started talking about risks, should we talk about open source, maybe because it's another important step to, to do a scan and uh, see if there are any third party or open source dependencies. So could you talk a little bit more about the way you assess those and how technical due diligence helps mitigate those risks? Chris? Yeah, it's always a hot potato that uh, goes between legal and tech DD. Uh, of course, I see the tech TD side as a kind of provider of input here for legal. So I'm not a lawyer, so I will definitely not um, 
give a final assessment on the legal situation here. But again, and maybe I'm very pragmatic there, but I also, I grew up in the startup and open source scene. I mean, I think the startup world as it exists today wouldn't exist if we hadn't open source software. In most of the cases, especially in, in hosted environments in SaaS set, in my opinion, uh, the topic of open source licenses, even relatively weak copyleft licenses is overrated. Yeah? It's still a kind of topic of, of anxiety for many lawyers and in legal DDs. But uh, let's be very honest, uh, in most of the cases, there are just a handful of open source licenses that are critical in a uh, SaaS context. That is AGPL, for example, that is probably the most prominent one because the AGPL license ex explicitly says that you have to comply with that license and, and uh, for example, share your code base even if you not distribute your software, but like, or distribute it in a, in a SaaS setup. Yeah. But the rest of the licenses, uh, as I said, I mean, I, I don't, I cannot count how many hours in my life I already set in, in legal calls about open source licenses, uh, lawyers being very worried about relatively liberal uh, open source licenses. Uh, I don't know what your experience here is, uh, Tobias, um, but I'm very pragmatic about that. Uh, me as well. Absolutely pragmatic. Uh, I think it's, yeah, an input for legal uh, and, and you answered it perfectly right. It's also not the, obviously not the most, the, the stuff that excites us most, right, Chris? But uh, obviously it needs to <laughs> yeah, be done. Sure. Um, and I'm also very happy that open source is there. Yeah, uh, but also there, I mean, there's, I think from a, coming from a founder's perspective or a CTO perspective, it's always a bit of a horror topic if you don't manage it properly, because then a DD comes and you're kind of deep down in your code base and you have to track, keep track of it and, okay, which license is this? And I mean, nowadays there are tools for this, right? So for example, like Fossa or similar tools where you can manage your software on a regular base, also monitor which software, which libraries your engineers use. You can even like exclude certain licenses and set alarms that you, for example, get a, get a notification if an AGPL is being used or some other licenses that you consider uh, critical. And I would definitely recommend to do that because it saves you so many headaches in case you actually get into a situation where you need to prove that you use uncritical uh, software. Okay. All right. Well, you're also assessing uh, the team and the team dynamics during the technical due diligence. So uh, how do you look at developer productivity and developer experience. Tobias, maybe let's start mm. with you this time. I, I also uh, told you about that, that topic before and I, I really like it and I, I, but I'm a bit torn to be honest. Like there are so many tools out there and so many different approaches. I also like developer experience more than developer productivity. Developer productivity meaning like looking at mostly Git uh, revisions and, and lines of code and like metrics that are based on that, there are many like, or it first sounds logic, but if you then really dig deeper, you, you find so many disconnects that lead to bad metrics and uh, bad visibility. While speaking of developer experience, it's about surveys, right? It, it's about, or mostly it's about like asking your people, how are you doing? And I, I believe that's make makes much more sense to uh, ask ask people for their roadblocks and instead of trying to artificially understand roadblocks blocks from code and then kind of trying to optimize that i mean what is the effect if you if you see that someone or that a company really has uh, a bad turnover time and uh, like less frequent deploys etc or, or the deployment takes ages it's hard to optimize like a KPI, right? You, you always see what, what you can do in the full stack and that deployment time is a problem, but uh, yeah, it's not that uh, the person you, you look at or the team you look at particularly can influence that KPI quickly. 
So I think like rather asking um, instead of um, observing is a, is a good thing to do. I, I partially agree with you here. Um, I think developer experience is still one of the most underrated topics because I think non-technical people always understand when they hear like good developer experience, they think of Club Mate and like goodies on the desk, right? So, um, and I think that link to productivity that is still underrated or unknown, at least in non-technical, among non-technical leaders. But I think going just from the developer experience point of view, you need at least an like average to senior team for this. If you rely on on surveys alone and you have a rather junior team, which can be the case in younger companies, I think that can become a problem. So I love having a combination of both. I mean, if we are not in a DD context, then But, but for example, when I'm an interim CTO or sometimes also as an advisor, I love using a Spotify health check, for example. That's a very simple survey. It has between 10 dimensions, yeah? like are you, are you pawns or players? How easy is it to deploy? How easy is it to refactor? Clean, cleanness of code base, stuff like that. So very Uh, that that's exactly developer experience yeah so so asking the engineers about the ease of, of their job in uh, several dimensions and that's a great instrument if you combine it with and i know dora metrics are highly like debated at the moment or heavily debated i know that but nevertheless what's the idea behind dora the idea is to to say whether your engineering organization is capable of changing things or changing things quickly and easily and frequently. Yeah. And I think that is a requirement that we need, especially like in, in, in the startup context. And this is why I like having both, yeah, having a set of a very lean set of metrics uh, to measure productivity, but not only rely on that, but also having that developer experience uh, thing here, especially because, and we are kind of leaving the DD context here a little bit, but I think it's important. If you just look at metrics, uh, very often it's being abused as a micromanagement tool for, for leadership uh, rather than helping Uh, engineers to to self improve yeah and uh th yeah this this is why i can just uh, underline what toby said about dx okay thank you and uh, yeah since we started talking about the team um how to communicate technical due diligence to the team because well the ceo is obviously involved the cto sometimes a product manager so the list kind of grows a little bit depending on the context so how do you communicate this in, in, in the most sustainable way so that nobody's confused and, you know, no rumors are going out? Uh, so what's your take on this, Chris? Let me start with a perspective when I was on the other side of the table, when I was CTO in startups. I experienced very often that uh, people just talk to the CTO, if at all. But uh, I mean, and that is something, for example, we don't do. We, if, if possible, we always want to talk to founders, CTO, CPO, if there's uh, any, a product manager and also one, two, three, depending on size of the engineers, because we want to get a good understanding of the engineering culture. And also, of course, engineers are more capable of guiding through, giving a tour through the code base or stuff like that. So. When you, when you ask about how to prepare your team for that, so I'm always a fan of giving them the true context. Yeah? Sometimes that's not the case because people are like founders are scared of telling the team the truth and say like, that's too much of a distraction or people might run away. My experience is that this is not the case. If you address it in a proactive and good manner and kind of keep your people emotionally safe and give them some backup it's it's not a thing address it as a challenge because in the end it's it's a challenge it's like can i pass this test in a way and 
make clear that it's not about being perfect on the one hand. Yeah, It's totally fine to talk about skeletons in the closet. Uh, what's even more important is that you're aware of the skeletons and also that you have a way out, yeah? that you have a plan already thought about how to mitigate um, issues or how to resolve them. Um, and that is something we keep seeing over and over that people misunderstand this, this a DD as a hide and seek game. And I think that's the worst thing that you can do because I mean, everybody on my team, myself included, then probably gets a little bit annoyed and says like, okay, now I want to find what's behind that and yeah? what's behind the high, hide and seek. So I rather prefer having a very honest conversation about the difficult topics and saying, okay, you know that it's there. So how do you get out of that architectural dead end into which you ran or the, the scalability issues? Okay, we know you have time until high season in three months. So what do, are you going to do about it? What are your mitigation plans here? So, and if, if I was a founder, I would brief my team on on this, like opening the conversation, but also addressing it with a potential solution and then seeing the auditors as sparring partners. That is one thing. That being said, also prepare your team. I mean, software engineers are probably the most honest people on earth and sometimes also like a bit pessimistic and cynical. Um, and that is also something where you need to protect your team a little bit. Um, because we already experienced like that we were sitting in an engineering session, for example, like a code work and, and as engineers started ranting about their code base yeah, and were like, everything is shit and everything is falling apart. And we're totally not being aware of what situation this was. And so if I were a founder having to prepare my team, I would always kind of train them how to address issues and how to talk about problems and solutions. I think that is definitely worth the effort. Just the question if, it's hel if it helps with the honest engineers, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. great. Just imagine like a person with a like Berlin accent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly like this. Exactly like this. I mean, we enjoy this, of course. It makes our jobs uh, way easier. But when I'm like, when I switch perspectives, of course, that would be a pretty good investment to talk to the team before. And also, of course, select people a little bit like this. I mean, always send in the the strongest engineers. But on the other hand, if, uh, if there is someone who's not super, let's say, strong at communication, then you might pair this person up with another engineer, right? Absolutely. I, I, I would just add that it also depends on a lot on the context, right? Um, if it's an acquisition, I think many founders are afraid of telling their team because of mm -hmm. the potential to fail, right? And many people in the team, uh, like that differs from a financing round, right? Many people in the team will get afraid whenever they think about the company being acquired. And at least from, from my perspective as like, let's say an engineer a few years ago would have been the case. Um, and I think that's why many people are afraid and I can understand that. That's funny. That's really funny because um, I had the different, a different experience as an engineer. And for me, it was always about context. And for example, if I know what the goal is uh, of a company, like being acquired by a bigger competitor, being, becoming part of that bigger competitor, for me, that might be a huge motivation. Um, and also like uh, an additional motivation to work towards a goal or work towards a better environment. But I agree with you. It's a slippery slope in an acquisition case. In a, it's a in question a funding of framing. Uh, situation. It's yeah, a question of exactly. framing, right? All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. So just a couple more questions. What are the trends or like the commonalities that you often see in terms of challenges and mistakes that founders or CTOs are making? when it comes to technical due diligence? I mean, one thing in uh, smaller companies, of course, is very often like making the first or strongest engineer, the, the CTO. Uh, that can be a great idea, 
but it's not necessarily always a great idea. Yeah. So first of it all, you lose a lot of engineering horse because the strongest engineer is suddenly covered with uh, administrative tasks and working on strategy and sitting in a lot of meetings. So this is something in second, many engineers even don't enjoy uh, those tasks. They want to build, they want to build software. They want to build great systems. And for them, it's a punishment to suddenly sit in meetings and writing a lot of concepts or whatever, uh, or managing stakeholders, stuff like that. So that is something that at least needs to be looked up uh, always. The second, I already mentioned it quickly, is engineers not being aware of the business context. Yeah. Sometimes we see that there's a lot of either too much pragmatism or a lot of like curiosity about the newest tech hype and engineers are pretty self-involved without delivering business value or building an actual great product. And yeah. so that is something we still keep seeing on a regular basis. It has improved though. I don't know what your experience is here, Tobias, but I have the feeling compared to 10 years ago, uh, engineers are much more business focused and product focused than they used to be. But maybe that's yeah. just my optimism. Actually, yeah, it's also a trend with CTOs, right? Like a few years ago, yeah. that was really like mostly about infrastructure, while now it's really about the business and understanding the business. And I think it's a big still Partly a, a big smell if there's a disconnect between the leadership of the company or let's say the CEO mm -hmm. and the CTO. Yeah. So this alignment is, is actually very important and one of the first things to look at, right? Especially in bigger companies, right? Where I, I still see it. I would, I would say also in smaller companies, even more. And by the way, we can see that um, this is the advertisement block that we discuss, didn't discuss before. So I'm, I'm part of Alpha List, uh, that great CTO net, network that Toby started. And whenever I have a meeting with the, these CTOs there, I realize how much business focus the conversations nowadays are, which is great. I think that is really an achievement and it has also an educational character that when young CTOs join this community and then suddenly people don't necessarily always talk about um, like the newest queuing system also do, but also about, about strategy and business. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I lost your question. Well, that's okay. I think, <laughs> I think we, we I, I think answered. it's answered. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. It's perfect. <clears throat> so maybe just one more, cause it's kind of a big one. Could you both share five tips? Your best tips could be the same. Hopefully not all of them for the founders who have technical due diligence coming tips or hacks, whatever you call it. Um, Toby, let's go with you. Wow. Don't be afraid is my first tip <laughs> because many people are afraid. And then maybe like, look at, like, I mean, there are many like guides online. I mean, Chris, you even published a few ones, like look, look at those. Like there, there are so many tips available. There's so good content available uh, these days. Uh, nowadays it's much easier and, and then start like understanding what is the most important blind spot that I have in my company. That's how I would approach it, right? Then have an idea on, on, on how to tackle that and what your idea is on that. That's how I would at least look at it and prepare. Chris, maybe you have five tips straight away, but um, I, I think <laughs> that's I, I, would do. <laughs> I, I try my best. I start talking and then you can come up with uh, the remaining uh, tips from your side. So first of it all, it would be manage the DD process proactively. Because we very often see that CTOs are a little bit in paralysis when it comes to DD. And together with a founder from the UK, we even like did a survey once or they did a survey and we, we uh, worked on that. So the amount, like the stress level of for CTOs uh, when there was any lack of transparency in DD processes went through the roof. And so it, it was absolutely correlated with how much information they got in advance. And I always 
tell CTOs we advise, please proactively ask for it. What it's your right to know what session are you going to have? What will you be talking about? Yeah. What artifacts do you need to deliver? What is expected of you? Who is the person or the persons who are going to interview you? Look them up and then like take the lead. Yeah. I love it when CTOs take the lead in a DD process and say like, look, okay, this is what I prepared. Yeah. Is that enough? Or do you want more and engage in the conversation? So that would be definitely my first um, advice here, because that's also something some people underestimate the DD starts with the very first contact, maybe even with the intro email. And it ends with like, the discussion of the report or whatever the last step is. Yeah. So it's not only the, the DD calls themselves. So that is the first thing. The second is, and it's, I know it's hard to really follow that rule, but at least try to pretend that you always have a DD, let's say on the horizon three months from now. Because that gives you the discipline. And I do this with my own company. And in some areas, we fail, yeah, certainly. But at least I try to get in that mindset, like, what if we had a, let's say, in my case, a financial DD three months from now, yeah, or if we had this and that. And for the tech DD, handle it the same way, because that lets you continuously check on where you are, what are your skeletons in the closet? Where are, where's documentation missing, for example? And which roles are, where do you have a bus index one, or we call it lottery index nowadays. What if someone would win the lottery and just fly away? It's a bit more positive than a bus index. Um, so yeah, documentation is definitely also a, a third tip. Like it, it doesn't have to be super excessive and heavyweight documentation. There are so many ways nowadays to, to document in a lightweight way, but do it regularly, make it part of your culture because that makes every DD easier, but it also makes your onboarding of new engineers easier. It makes discussions easier. Lean, Lean X founder the other day said something super interesting. And I love that, of course. He said, DDs are always being perceived as a, as a huge uh, challenge and a huge overhead, but every DD prepared me for the next stage of growth and for the next DDs coming. And it was kind of a test. And I really loved that attitude towards it. So that would be part of that advice. I lost track. I think I had four now, right? Do I owe you a fifth one? Just one. Like have, um, present your skeletons openly, but have a solution ready. Yeah. That, uh, we discussed it beforehand, but that w that's a core advice from my side. I think that's the best one. Actually, you put, you should put that on the first place. Yeah. And I fully agree. Like if, if you see it as a permanent process and you have that in mind from the start, um, then it's much easier and it, it makes you resilient, more resilient and actually better in what you do. I, I partly disagree with that as well, because it's also lots of effort partly, right? And uh, you really have to choose your battles of where you want to invest and, and improve from the start, especially a mm -hmm. small company, right? The bigger you get, the, the easier it is to manage your strategy, your, your uh, readiness for a DD, your homework, but for smaller ones, it's not always easy. And I, I'm not saying that you have to have all the documents ready at any time, but what you can do, for example, as a CTO, once per quarter, quarter, reserve half a day to zoom out and say, what if we had a DD next week, and then next month, in three months, whatever. Yeah. So because whenever you zoom out and have that meta perspective on your own company, this is when you really start thinking about what is important. What do I have to do? to take care of next. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, we, we have, of course, uh, clients like who used to be targets. Like we, we used to look at them in a whatever DD context, like on the buyer side or investor side. And then later they reached out to us and said, Hey, can we do this on a regular basis? Because that was <laughs> such a useful sparring. We want to get into that perspective once in a while, twice a year or four times a year or whatever. And I think 
that is really a valuable exercise, whether you do it with a buddy or yourself or you get an external person for that or a firm for that. That doesn't matter. But I think that is the minimum. And then you can still say, uh, fuck it, I, I don't document this or that or I don't have an update on this. That's fine. But knowing about your issues and not letting them outgrow your capabilities, I think that's, that's uh, important here. I, I just developed like a format we should launch soon. It's like a, a monthly challenge, like Chris's monthly challenge. Uh, on, on tech. Like, I would love that. <laughs> answer the, that question straight away, please. <laughs> Thank you for your answers. It was, it was great. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Also, I have to mention that uh, Chris and uh, his team have prepared a cheat sheet for B2B SaaS acquisitions for the tech due diligence. I will link it in the comments so you can download it, see it. So yeah, thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for, so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Sure, anytime. <laughs> you too, bye.